today is mostly about some technicalities of getting your hands on hydrodynamic model data, which, as I say, I hope will be useful to you. And also really want to um, have some interaction with you about what are the issues that you're dealing with and, and need data for. Um, so this is the outline of my talk. Um, first of all, about acquisition of ocean data. We have various ways of getting ocean data and, and I'll just touch on some of those and, and where to get information and what are the important variables you need to think about is one of the things I want to mention. And then I'm going to tour the, uh, tour the Caribbean a bit um, with the, uh, the people that have engaged with us, particularly in our last workshop in November and try and answer some of their questions. And then the second part of the talk will be actually accessing NEMO model data using the COAST uh, software tool. And then I'll summarize. So um, let's see how that goes. So first of all, one example of a way to get your hands on um, model data or, or any other types of, of various other types of um, ocean data is to go to the Copernicus Marine Service. And the website is at marine.copernicus.eu. It's actually a European um, service, but it has global models and global satellite data there. And I definitely advise you to have, as a first look, have a quick look there, and you'll find quite a lot of products that could be of interest. And I'll just show you a couple of things. If you look at the four main boxes in the middle of the screen, you can see it says ocean products, ocean state report, uh, ocean monitoring indicators and ocean visualization. So there is actually a visualization tool in there, which is, is very helpful. If you look at ocean products, you will actually find uh, model outputs and it refers to hindcasts, nowcasts and forecasts. And in case if you're not a modeler, or you're not into the forecasting side of it, hindcasts is a, a, a prediction, if you like, or a model output for the past. Um, now casts right now, obviously just giving the state of a situation right now and forecasts maybe a few days or months or even a projection into the future. Um, so forecasts are for in the future. Um, the ocean state report is some uh, reports that are produced every year to tell us where we're, where we're at, you know, what's happening with the ocean. And um, it now goes back over 20 years and it includes various um, severe events that have occurred each year. So um, that can be interesting to read. And then the ocean monitoring indicators, this is where you find your essential um, variables. And um, I'll show you something about that now, but uh, feel free to go to that and nothing will cost you money. You can download things. Obviously there is a bit of a learning curve as to how to access it, but it's all fairly intuitive. And this is just one example of um, an ocean product that you can get, which is, this is actually an, an indicator of the, the trend um, in ocean primary productivity from satellite data, which is actually using chlorophyll A as the, um, as the basic variable, which is being observed. And it's a trend over the years, 1997 to 2019. So the recent past. And what you're seeing here is that in a large part of the Atlantic Ocean, which is, is fairly just to the left of center here, uh, the North Atlantic, there is actually a reduction in, um, in productivity in recent years. Um, in the North, Northern North Atlantic and in the latitude of Europe and the UK, to the west of us at any rate, there is actually um, an increase in productivity. But if you look at our islands themselves in the Northwest um, of Scotland, you can actually see another dark, quite a deep blue patch. So that is a reduction in, very, in, in uh, productivity. So these kind of trends um, are very valuable for us to look at and to understand what's going on. Another indicator here is surface pH. Um, this is the other way of looking at uh, is basically ocean acidification. If the seawater pH is reducing, then the water is getting less alkaline, more acidic. We often call it ocean acidification. It's getting less alkaline. But at any rate, you can see that that is a steady trend since the 1980s to the present day. Um, and, and the numbers don't mean very much to me, but if you are looking at that particular parameter, it's obviously happening due to the increased amount of um, carbon dioxide being um, dissolved in the ocean. And another thing you can look at is changes in ocean currents. 
Um, sometimes this is a, a tricky thing to look at because what we're looking at here is an anomaly map, which means that it's taking the difference in the year 2017 from a longer term average of ocean currents. So we know we've got an ocean circulation pattern and whether they're stronger or weaker in certain years. And again, if we look at the, um, at the, at the Atlantic on the, towards the right, and we can see that the Gulf Stream has intensified a little bit in that it seems to um, a little bit more red in the North Atlantic. There's a little bit of red in the Gulf of Mexico, but there's actually a reduction or a, a, a slowing down of the Guyana current, which um, was, you know, it's it's a big feeder for the Caribbean. So, um, but not you can't make very much of that in isolation. So, but it is showing that there are changes in currents on an on an annual basis from an interannual mean um, of a you know, around uh, maybe 30 centimeters per second, plus or minus 30 centimeters per second. And across across the Pacific, some of these equatorial currents are quite important to, to understand what's happening with the ocean teleconnections and um, El Nino Southern Oscillation, things like this. Right, so um, one other thing, which we all are, you know, really have to be paying a lot of attention to is, um, the mean sea level of the global ocean, and this has been this has been taken from satellite altimeter data. So all these variables um, are basically being taken from satellite data, and uh, this allows us to note that that I think you can tell that um, since 1992, because obviously we only have satellite data for the fairly recent past, but we now have 30 years of satellite data. And, and sea level has been rising pretty steadily. And if we combine that with earlier trends from the 20th century, um, we can we can actually see that there's an acceleration in the global sea level um, increase. But that's um, something we'll come back to. Okay, but another place you can go and you can get free data is um, the um, National Data Boy Center. This is the NOAA. U.S. NOAA um, National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and you can see that there are little um, little tags with numbers in them. You can click on those. You can go to this website and you can click on those, and you can get generally wave boy data and also um, met ocean variables anyway for for various locations in the Caribbean. And we've used some of them, and I think Lucy will refer to that later. So um, if you want to look at model outputs, uh, then you go to the ocean products, the first button, and you come up with a screen like this. And I, in this screen, you can actually enter a keyword. For instance, you can put wave height, or you can put uh, current or temperature. And you can also zoom in. It will give you an option to, um, to choose the years when you want. In this case, you know, it's it's offering you from 1992 to, to the present day, and you can select your parameters and you can find the forecasts or the uh, hindcasts and reanalysis that have been run that will include that data, and you can also download that data. Now, I want to come back to our present workshop and um, this uh, sequence of, um, of events that we've been holding. So in, for those of you who remember who attended, we held a workshop in November in 2020, um, also online, of course. And um, we asked you some questions on a survey at the end and we got, we got some responses. And this is what it said. Um, what are your, first question was, what are your coastal management information needs and areas of concern? And this is some of the answers that we got. Data to support coastal hazard and risk assessment. This is reassuring because this says we're on the right track because this is ma mainly what we've been talking about over our time um, working on the Commonwealth Marine Economies program. We are, people are concerned about rates of beach erosion, sea level rise and sargassum transport. Good, that's the thing we fo focused on. Storm surge, sea level rise, yes. EZ monitoring and near coastal. Increased monitoring and data management and analysis. Data including sea levels, bathymetry, current waves, wind. Yes, we would agree with all of that. Um, graphical real-time real tide data. Um, that's something else to be followed up, up perhaps separately. Um, storm surge modeling, storm-driven wave modeling, underwater bathymetry, tsunami wave modeling, precise localized sea level rise capacity, unregulated and unreported fishing activity for pelagics, mineral resources info for the EZ, 
hot spots in the Cayman Trench, particularly for underwater landslips, slides and slumps due to the tsunami threat, sand transport off the, the, um, the west side of uh, Grand Cayman, especially deep water stockpiles, and information regarding deep water dredging activity for safe and environmentally responsible sand recovery, prime to the carbon cal cal calcium carbonate going back into solution in deep water. Um, I hope Simon is with us today from Cayman. He does ask the note that we did write down, you know, we did capture what he was talking about, what he was asking us. That was pretty comprehensive. Um, the next one, um, there were two more questions. What data do you already access and what would you like to acquire? So basically it's somewhat re um, um, repetitive, but short-term wave current water level and some bathymetry data, offshore marine data. We have access to offshore mineral extraction data. We'd like more bathymetry data. But collect met ocean data on a project. We do collect met ocean data on a project basis. Would like a framework for a national approach rather than a piecemeal approach. Access to currents, waves, and tides. Bathymetry comes back around again and again. And absolutely, we would agree with that because if you want to do any modeling, the base the baseline thing that you need is is detailed bathymetry for your coastal zone, particularly. We have tide gauge information for two locations. We would like to acquire wave monitoring equipment. Already collect satellite altimetry, imagery, and beach profiles. Require local data input for modeling. We have UNESCO's sea level sensor, some meteorological info. Very keen to get underwater bathymetry data, et cetera. And that could be passed on to NOAA and the um, uh, what's that? Natural Hazard Center. Anyway, for, um, sorry, National Hurricane Center for storm surge modeling. And then we, the final question, where should we focus our models? Can you identify coastal locations of interest in your own country? And we did get a feedback um, from various places and we included a selected um, 40 points to um, produce model output related to the countries that we were engaging with and also including a, couple, a few more just to make sure we had good coverage of, of the Caribbean Sea area. So I should say all these are individual responses. So um, we had about 10 people respond and we've, you know, basically showing what they were telling us. So these are the output locations that I've set up. Um, we did obviously focus our case study on St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So um, there are seven points that have been selected around the coast, um, particularly obviously the Argyle International Airport, Kingstown Harbour, Black Point and Georgetown on the East Coast, and some on the Southwest Coast, um, also one in the North at Oia, and one in just to capture the Grenadines as well, because I must admit we didn't spend um, a lot of time modeling the Grenadines and Tobago Keys. So likewise for Jamaica, we've identified some locations partly based on feedback from our contacts in Jamaica and um, including Kingston Harbour, for instance, and the Port Royal Keys. Um, and then some around the North Coast. Um, for Belize, again, we've had projects running in Belize and so we have um, given quite a, a number of points there. Um, obviously, the offshore barrier reef, which is a key feature of the area. And then I've added a couple for other smaller island states, um, for the Cayman Islands, for St. Lucia, for Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda, um, Trinidad and Tobago. And I've worked there and I know people there and um, I, I sort of selected a few more points for there. And we, we've had engagement there as well. Grenada and Guyana. Now, if you would like to look through that list and say, oh, but you've missed a really key point that you really would like to see included, A, you will get the tool to work with it yourself and actually be able to add in a lot long point when you use the coast tool. Um, but also just type in the chat if you want to say, um, you know what, you missed us off, um, please let us know. So I'm really hoping you'll be able to uh, give us a bit more feedback. And so this is the distribution of the output points that I've included. You can see there's quite a lot on the Leeward Islands arc in the Eastern Caribbean, a few around Jamaica, Cayman, and then we got, um, I should say, a few around, I don't know why they're not in red, but a few around Trinidad and Tobago, and, and there's one sort of off the, uh, um, a little bit uh, off the screen, I think, on, uh, on Guyana, and then a cluster in Belize. So, I now want to do 
a tour of the Caribbean. So I'm just going to stop sharing this screen and start sharing another one. And I hope I can mm. see. And as I was mentioning, we can see some really important underwater features, deep trenches and uh, other sort of shallow, shallower areas. Um, you can see that there is obviously the Leeward Islands arc. You can see that Trinidad and Tobago sit on a continental shelf. There's quite a wide shelf um, around Nicaragua, Honduras, and um, into the Gulf of Mexico. We're not touching the Gulf of Mexico. And um, you can also see, of course, north of the Caribbean, Bahamas, and, um, and so on. So I'm going to get, now choose to go to Trinidad. And I hope you're all following me. Did that move? Yep. And we're going down the coast a bit so we can actually see. Um, we see. Um, first of all, we're seeing the, the mouth of the Orinoco and then we're going down to Guyana. So as we come along the coast, we can obviously see, as I say, um, this is relatively shallow water. The Gulf of Paria is, is a about 40 meters deep. And then we come to, you can see the edge and uh, Tobago is just on the continental shelf. And then we get into the deeper water. And there we have the, uh, the Leeward Islands arc. And we're moving through Vincent and the Grenadines, past St. Lucia, and there's Dominica. I haven't picked every island to give us a little output point, but there's Antigua and Barbuda. And there we go west. And um, we pass Puerto Rico, and we can see this very steep slope here in this, in this region. So is anybody um, typing any numbers in where we, where we haven't been and where we, where we should be looking? So there we have Jamaica, and then we're going to go further west and uh, follow the Cayman Trench and find, if we can, the islands of uh, the Cayman Islands. We're finding the Bay Islands. Ah, oh, they're, they're is eluding me at the moment. There they are. There's the Cayman Islands right on the edge of that really deep trench. And we're going across to Belize. And there's the coast of Belize. So. OK, um, yeah, I will stop sharing that. And then I'm going to go to a slide for each of the locations. And back to my, my slides, if I can. So hopefully we're back on the slideshow. So St. Vincent and the Grenadines, obviously part of the um, Windward Islands and part of the Lesser Antilles. It's a steep volcanic main island with low-lying coral keys to the south, and its natural hazards are subject to hurricanes, but it is south of the main storm track, so they're, they're less frequent than some countries are affected and impacted by. It also has the threat of a volcanic eruption because there's an active volcano and a possible tsunami if an underwater landslide or earthquake happens, heavy rainfall causing landslides, coastal erosion and flooding, and the effects of sea level rise, storm surge and waves. I don't know whether anybody who is here from St. Vincent would like to sort of speak up and say, what about we haven't included? Is there any other feature that we should be um, looking at for, for St. Vincent and the Grenadines? I know Cameron's there. Don't know whether you want to say anything, Cameron. No answer at the moment. Okay. Yeah, hello. Good so, morning. Oh, hello. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Hi. Good morning. Um, you guys do a lot of work in um, coastal modern and stuff like that. I can't really think of anything off the top of my head um, that was wasn't covered. Um, Thank you. All right. That's good yeah. because um, you know if you think of anything later, we obviously will will add to our our dossier. And we know that many of the islands in this region are affected similarly by these you know the same natural hazards. Small island states, um, a coast, uh, uh, they're, they're the coast of the area. Even if they're not low lying islands, are the area where the people are concentrated, living in, in the more uh, low lying and um, relatively flat land at the coast, and therefore they're at risk. Um, coastal risks of erosion and flooding 
uh, probably apply in every country. So then um, here we are, uh, Jamaica, third largest island of the Greater Antilles and in the Caribbean. Population of 2.9 million, and it's the third most populous English speaking country in the Americas and the fourth most populous country in the Caribbean. Kingston Harbour is the seventh largest natural harbour in the world. And the natural hazards, again, subject to hurricanes, it's on the main storm track and the climate change effects, including sea level rise. And I would say, being a larger island, you know, there may be, it may be relatively. Um, less affected than some of the smaller islands, but I don't know whether that would be fair to say. And um, if anyone's here from Jamaica, if they want to speak up and say, ah, you haven't you know, written down this key thing that we need to know about Jamaica. Anybody? Okay, I'm going to pass on, because I say much of this will be repeated anyway. So Belize lies on the Northeast coast of Central America, bordered by Mexico and Guatemala. It's got a very long coastline, predominantly marshy, which is protected by the second longest barrier reef in the world. I'm sure you know which is the largest. And again, same natural hazards, hurricanes, storm surge, coastal floods, landslides and wind damage. The Cayman Islands. It's not an area that we've looked into in, in great detail, and I hope Simon is with us, and I hope we are still um, at least correctly addressing some of the issues. This is a self-governing British overseas territory in the Western Caribbean. So actually, sadly, it hasn't been part of the Commonwealth Marine Economies Programme. It's part of the Greater Antilles. It consists of three islands situated on the Cayman Bank, just north of the Cayman Trench, which reaches 6,000 metres deep. Uh, if you could see through the water, it would be quite uh, vertiginous, I think, sitting right there. The terrain is mostly a low-lying limestone base surrounded by coral reefs with a maximum elevation 43 meters. So I'm sure they are worried about storm surges and um, hurricane storm surges and waves, coastal erosion and flooding will all again be issues. St. Lucia, another volcanic island in the Windward Islands and Lesser Antilles, same uh, tropical storms, hurricanes, winds and heavy rainfall. Dominica, northernmost of the Windward Islands, some say southernmost of the Leeward Islands. Anyway, I'm not going to dispute that. Um, volcanic and mountainous, vulnerable to hurricanes, it's on the main track. And a Category 5 Hurricane Maria struck the island in September 2017, which many of you will remember, and it caused losses of approximately 930 million US dollars or 226 percent of GDP, which is very frightening and a, a really huge impact for a small island state. The tide gauge was destroyed and we actually replaced it as part of that CME program, but I'm sure the tide gauge was the least of people's worries at that time, obviously with huge parts of the island um, flattened by the, by the directors. Antigua and Barbuda, a twin island state again, I think there may be one or two other islands, small islands. Um, Low-lying islands, the terrain's influenced more by limestone formation than volcanic activity. Hurricanes strike on average once a year, including Hurricane Irma in that same September 2017 terrible period when we had a train of hurricanes one after another. And that damaged 95% of the structures on Barbuda and 1,800 people were evacuated to Antigua. So again, very traumatic, still recovering, a hard, uh, a very hard time. And you can't alter the fact that this, this um, location is, is right on the storm track. Trinidad and Tobago in the southernmost, is the southernmost country in the Windward Islands situated on the continental shelf, very close to Venezuela. It's only about nine kilometers, I believe, at the closest point, with the shallow sea Gulf of Paria lying between them. It's south of the main hurricane track, but still is subject to tropical storms. And we'll have, again, the same natural hazards, coastal erosion and flooding due to storms and waves. And um, finally, Grenada. No, not finally, we've got one more, but anyway. Windward Islands, Lesser Antilles again, um, south of... Um, south of St. Vincent and just north of Tobago. And uh, it consists of the island of Grenada, but also some of the islands of the Grenadines. It's a volcanic origin with a mountainous interior. And again, all the same natural hazards. And finally, Guyana, which is an English speaking coastal state on the South American mainland. I think it may be the only English speaking state in South America. Um, 
between Venezuela and Suriname. It's a low, muddy coastal plain. And their problem is that that, that coastal plain is, lies below sea level a half to one metre below sea level and is generally defended by seawalls. And at one time would have had a large extensive um, a mangrove forest along the, along the uh, coast, but I'm not sure how much of that remains. So natural hazards, sea level rise, coastal and river flooding. Right, so um, yeah, that may have been boring. I wanted to really just get people to, if they can, pop anything in the chat about you know, have we missed anywhere? And do you want anything else to be added to the list of hazards? But I think we can identify that this, you know, the same hazards are being seen everywhere. I just wanted to um, briefly show some particle trajectories for each of these locations. So what I've done is I've used one of the locations um, of my 40 and, um, and picked a point and released some particles. I haven't personally. Um, Dr. Radami, Dr. Miyog Radami, who you've heard yesterday, um, beautifully describing all the work she's done on sargassum tracking. She has done the, uh, the particle tracking. All I've done is select the particles from one of our output locations. So um, here we have on the, uh, um, for the Southeast Caribbean and Guyana, some particles um, going through. Now, on, on the, on the left-hand um, plot, you can actually see there's quite a bit of eddying. Um, the, um, the what I did here was take two particles offshore of Guyana, and both of them, are, are, are the red dots, you can see in, in each one. Um, but if you look at the nearer shore one, it actually is taking a very near shore trajectory, and it's actually hugging the coast and going through um, into the Gulf of Paria, most of the particles are close together, but on the slightly offshore one, this, this um, is getting into the main um, train of the Guyana current and the particles are going outside of Trinidad. They're um, actually doing a bit of eddying around as they progress in and pass through the Leeward Islands. And we have some, uh, some more for Tobago, Grenada and St. Vincent. Again, you can see what happens if you release a particle in your location. So uh, we've got one released uh, in Tobago on the left. And again, that's following this Guyana current and into the Caribbean, the Caribbean current. Um, the upper right uh, particle is released at St. Vincent, just to the east of St. Vincent, and it's doing some nice eddying. Um, this is a multiple particle. So what you're seeing is a group which each represent more than one particle effectively, but um, just that its behavior separating because there is actually eddying going on in the currents, which uh, makes it more interesting. And then on the bottom right, we've got um, some particles released in Grenada, just off Grenada, and they, they are shooting along because they are actually getting really into the core of the uh, Caribbean current and um, being transported quite fast to the Northwest. And uh, finally, we've got some from um, Antigua and Barbuda, and um, Jamaica, this is one released from Kingston Harbour, and the Cayman Islands and Belize. Because you see the Cayman Islands is actually quite interesting because we get a bifurcation of the flow. Um, this is just arbitrarily one, you know, a location, but um, some, some of the flow is going to the Northwest and some is going back to the Southeast. And in Belize, we've mostly got um, a flow to the North, the coastal current going North, but there's a little bit of eddying around um, in the southern part of that track. Right, okay, so what you really come for to hear about um, how to get access to the NEMO model outputs and just reiterating what was the extent of the model. Um, as you can see, it's um, extending from about 50 degrees to 100 degrees west and from uh, about five degrees north to 30 odd degrees north. and the model itself includes the Gulf of Mexico because that is a continuous sea, sea area that's um, part of our, it's, it, it's needed because it's obviously downstream of, of the Caribbean in general. But what we have done is we've actually excluded anything in the Pacific. We're not modeling the Pacific because it's not connected. So we've got bits of the Atlantic, um, the Caribbean Sea itself, and the, um, the Gulf of Mexico and out back into the Atlantic again. And we know that um, the, we've taken a horizontal resolution of a twelfth of a degree latitude and longitude, which gives us about a nine kilometer resolution in horizontal. The vertical resolution is 75 levels um, 
with um, a sigma hybrid sigma and Z partial step level. That's a bit complicated. I'm not really going to explain it, but it um, is one of the big issues about um, ocean models and ocean to coastal models is how we resolve the vertical dimension in the flow. And the model will simulate sea surface height, currents, temperature, and salinity. And you can choose to include the river outflow at the coast or not, which as Valerie and Marta mentioned yesterday, is not fully working yet, but that will be done soon. So what we'd actually chose, what we tried to do was to complete a 10 year run of this model so that all that uh, 10 years was available and we could look at the interannual variability. And in fact, up to now we've got six years, um, or maybe seven years completed and um, it's still um, chugging along. So eventually there will be, not very long, I mean, maybe next week the, the model will have finished running. And this is repeating some of the outputs that you saw yesterday, just to remind you what they look like. And this is a, a comparison of the sea surface temperature with MODIS uh, satellite product for the months of October to December in 2009. So what we've got on the, in the vertical, if you like, the columns represent the month of October, November or December. And then on the horizontal, we've got uh, the top three uh, panels are with rivers. The middle one is the MODIS output and the bottom one is the no rivers output. And as you can see, there is, um, you know, reasonable agreement. We're seeing the changing temperatures through that period of time. It's cooling off a bit. And, um, and we're also seeing a slight difference. I don't know whether it's very easy to see, but there is a slight difference whether you have uh, rivers included or not. And I'll just point out, say, if you look on the right hand column, then the one with rivers at the top and the one without rivers at the bottom you can actually see, see slightly different patches of color in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So you can tell there is a difference, it's not identical, um, but the subtle differences. So it doesn't make so much difference to temperatures. But when you put the, um, so when you're looking at salinity with and without rivers, obviously this does have a bit more um, of an impact. And you can see very, very well the um, effect of the Orinoco and the Mississippi in these in these uh, plots. I've only chosen the two, it's a three month, I should say three month averages. I've only chosen the ones that are looking at the wet season, which shows a bit more dramatic difference. So the top panels are no rivers and the bottom panels are with rivers. And um, as I say, you can see the um, lower salinity, the fresh water coming from the Orinoco and from the Mississippi. Um, it's particularly marked in the, in the um, Gulf of Mexico because we already do have some of the outflow from the Amazon appearing in our model. And so we have fresher water coming in from that southeastern boundary. And then if you look again, current speed with and without rivers, um, the top panels are the no rivers and the bottom panels are the with rivers. And again, I was just going to point out that you can see differences just if you take the left hand panel and you look in the Gulf of Mexico, you can see that two eddies have detached from the loop current and um, with rivers, it seems like they've merged, whereas without rivers, they seem a little more distinct. Um, so the pattern in that area is definitely a bit different. And so again, we can see some subtle differences, um, but it's maybe uh, not so obvious within the Caribbean itself. We're not going to bother um, worrying about what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico, which is a very interesting area, but it's not in the Caribbean. So we're, we're going to uh, leave that alone for now. Right. Okay, that was a brief um, review of um, the things we've been looking at. And when you come back after a short break, then we will 